Hey there, how are you? I'm well, Lucy, how are you? I am great. I'm going to turn up my volume a little bit so I can hear you okay. Um, we are recording a session on um, an interview with the owner of the Twitter handle, Bad Hippa Takes. By way of introduction, um, at the start of the pandemic, um, all the way through the insurrection in the Capitol and on into the vaccine rollout, uh, nationwide healthcare privacy law, HIPAA, with two A's and one P, has gotten more famous and more misunderstood than ever. Out of this morass of politicization and polemic emerged uh, the Twitter handle, uh, Bad HIPAA Takes, at Bad H-I-P-P-A, notice the misspelling. This Twitter handle shines a light on the absurd, the funny, the sad, and even the accurate in a must follow for anyone interested in privacy. Today, I'm going to be interviewing the author of that handle and asking them some questions based on what they've seen in the past year and the future of uh, health information privacy law in the US. So I'm just going to kick it off and get started. I think the first question we want to know is what motivated you to start tweeting about bad hepatics? It all started with the epidemic of masks exemption cards that showed up on Twitter back in May of 2020 when I created the account. These were being shared all over by this fictitious Freedom to Breathe agency, and um, you know, they were talking about how you know, HIPAA spelled incorrectly, of course, and the Fourth Amendment prohibit people from requiring masks and not being able to ask about what, you know, why you're not wearing a mask and, and those sort of things. And those cards re you know, referenced those, those, uh, those laws and <clears throat> used official government logos to appear credible and, and official. This misinformation campaign really bothered me. I wanted to see if I could do something to put a stop to it. Uh, in retrospect, the answer is no, clearly, but uh, <laughs> that, that's just, that's, here we are. Um, and I'm a, I'm a follower of the Bad Legal Takes account and a few others in that same Bad Takes vein on Twitter. And I, and I thought that was a pretty good format to emulate. So I started there and it just kept going. And here we are 13 months later. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we're going to be at it for a while, no doubt. Now. When we were first arranging this, I checked and you had about 15,000 followers. That was a couple of months ago. What are you up to today? And, and does it surprise you that that many people are following along? I, I, I'm over 18,000 and, and growing as of today. There's actually literally as we're recording this session, there's an incident going on with one of the one of the people that is, has become a, a favorite bad HIPAA tweeter, Marjorie Taylor Greene. And, you know, my, my mentions are absolutely exploding. Uh, I, I'm tremendously surprised by this. I, I never imagined that such a niche area of interest would attract this kind of attention. You know, I, I think I tapped into a moment. People found the message relevant and humorous. I get a lot of gratification from knowing that I make people laugh with my content. I get some nice DMs from people thanking me for running the account, which is, which is always good. I don't do any kind of you know, tweet promotion or monetization or advertising. So I've had solicitations for it. It's just not my thing. So it's all yeah. been purely organic growth. Um, you definitely, people definitely get more with honey than with vinegar. And I think humor, you know, goes a long way about that. Um, and we'll get to Marjorie Taylor Greene maybe in a minute, but I guess my next question is sort of looking back over the last 13 months, almost 14 months now, do you feel like the takes you, you find sort of have categories and what would those categories be? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the lowest hanging fruit is just the simple misspelling, which, you know, that's, that's kind of boring on its own. You know, people spelling it with, you know, two P's and one A, thinking that the P's stand for privacy protection most of the time, which, of course, there's no privacy mentioned in the name of, of the act. Um, then there's, you know, the, the excuses for not wearing masks and wanting exemptions from that, excuses for not talking about vaccination status. That's another kind of major category and probably the, the largest overall in volume. Uh, early on, when contact tracing was a new thing people were learning about, because probably most people had never heard of it before, uh, that was a big topic. People were thinking that contact tracers were, you know, violating HIPAA by asking about, you know, how you came to 
contract the, the virus. Right. Then there's the re reporters, you know, talking about sports injuries or players being out for COVID or, you know, whether they're vaccinated or not. And, you know, this, this is all stuff that's like the, the players have waived their privacy in, in most cases, you know, under the league collective bargaining agreements and, and other contracts. So that's you know, not, not really a violation, but it keeps coming up. And then there's the, the final category really is the celebrity and politician stuff. You know, this, this politician saying, you know, X or Y is a HIPAA violation when it's not, or, you know, the members of the public getting upset when, you know, their guy has some kind of, you know, health information outed to the public by, you know, reporters or people on Twitter or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then in terms of all of those categories, and I'm sure that there will be more hot, bad takes coming in the future, but like, what's your top one or, or the favorite one you've had so far? And I saw the Green Day one just today, I was checking. Um, and so that was pretty good. But um, what's your favorite? Yeah, I, I think, I don't know if I have a favorite bad take, you know, there, there have been so, so, so many, and I tried, you know, researching back through my timeline and couldn't find one that really jumped out, but you know, by just by volume, you know, the the reactions by the public to the the contact tracing early on and, and the more recent announcements by the administration about the door-to-door -door vaccination outreach, that one got a lot of attention very quickly. And you know, I, I want to say something about that. You know, personally, I'm very disappointed in the messaging on both of these topics. You know, the administration really stepped in it when they spoke out so vaguely about this door-to-door -door initiative and left room for the most disingenuous of their opponents to you know make all these these accusations that the government was keeping you know secret lists of unvaccinated people and, and all kind of this this nonsense yeah <clears throat> you know and, and and the whole just overall politic politic politicizing our response to the pandemic has has cost people their lives and and that's just it's just unforgivable yeah no it's and i mean as somebody who used to explain hipaa to the rest of my political colleagues in the government i I, I feel that very um, at a very empathetic level because I remember my own conversations where somebody would say, well, doesn't it do blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, actually it doesn't do that at all. Um, and so I think a, an, a really important object lesson uh, in the privacy realm for all this is that you can't explain it simply enough, often enough. Um, and that's one of the great things about your handle is that it, it tries to get to the nut of what what really is the health information privacy law and what it what it means and then of course and we'll talk about this in a little bit where does it not apply which is a really key key part of it um so i wanted to ask you you may it makes people who read your handle laugh but you must be laughing yourself sometimes so do you have you know a favorite humorous uh, moment with your handle or reply to uh something you posted yeah, there there was one, you know, a day ago, which, you know, I'll, <laughs> there was a good HIPAA take because there was an actual violation involved, but the, the comedy of it was the set of circumstances surrounding it. I'll, I'll read the tweet and kind of paraphrase what, uh, what they say, because there's some stuff in it that's a little, you know, uh, adult in nature, but, you know. Oh, I think I know uh, which one you're going to talk about. That one was. Yeah, was I, I bet you do. Yeah, so this is, an, yeah. Uh, this is a warning on the recording. Uh, people under 18 shouldn't be listening to this part of the recording. Now, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the, the handle that tweeted it out, you know, goes by the name Bowl Cut Boy. And they said, you know, uh, one of my fans got fired from his job because he violated HIPAA when he posted a video of him performing a sexual act, I'll say, in a private inventory room for his only fans and exposed six patient names and addresses. No words. And I mean, th this one was just hilarious to me because, you know, it's it, talk about a, a, a bad way to get fired and, <laughs> you know, a, a ridiculous way to violate HIPAA. And not to mention, is the person who tweeted that, should they even be telling the story of somebody else's firing in such uh, extraordinary circumstances? Like there's a whole privacy angle to that too, right? The person, oh, you know, right? Yeah. they're telling a story about somebody else. They're not telling their own story. Yeah, of course, who knows if it's true or not. I mean, you know, if it's on the internet, it must be true. Right. You know, insert laugh track here. 
Right. Well, that kind of takes me to the, the one that I, I found one of the funniest ones here, which was you, several months ago, you, you had a whole string from a, a Twitter author who was claiming that HIPAA derived from the Nuremberg Treaty. And I know quite a lot about the history of privacy laws. And most people date our concern about health information privacy to the 1970s, the Belmont Report, or maybe farther back to Justice Brandeis, but I've never really heard the Nuremberg trials cited. Um, I have to say, I did go down the rabbit hole of that tweeter's tweets to like kind of see what was there and whether there was any substance, like did I miss something? Should I educate myself on something? It turned out to be a complete dead end. Um, but I wonder if you ever see takes yourself that you're like, hmm, is there, is it, should I go down that rabbit hole? Should I check on whether that thing is true or not? Um, or mostly uh, you avoid the bait. So like any human, uh, I'm not always as thoughtful as I probably should be. Uh, but there are definitely times when I will pause and review the regulation, review the content that I'm looking at, look for more context and, and try to find, you know, find out more about who said what and why and, and what, what's behind it. There, there are plenty of submissions I won't take on at all just due to the nature of the topic. Some, some things are too radioactive, even, even for an anonymous account to really want to engage with or things I just don't want to associate myself with. You know, a recent example, you know, and this isn't too bad, but you know, there, there was a, another tweet I'll kind of, you know, paraphrase a little bit, because again, it's got you know, some, you know, profanities in it uh, from a, a person saying they're an, an ER nurse um, had a effing cop come up to the nurse's station trying to find out if a patient was getting discharged, quote, so we can detain the individual on the way out of the hospital. I told him to get effed if he thought I was going to violate HIPAA and called security. Felt good. So th this was a person who, you know, in, in a, you know, healthcare provider capacity, right, HIPAA does apply, but does it apply to this exact situation? And I, you know, I had to go reread the regulation and, and specifically look for some cases where disclosures to law enforcement without you know patient authorization are allowed and you know it's quite possible that there that this does fall under one of those exceptions but i don't know i would be speculating because there's not enough facts in the tweet to really come to a solid conclusion so that's that's one where i i, I couched my response a bit with you know the, the possibility that there's not enough information Right. Well, and there are always that. I mean, I have this myself. I don't have 18,000 followers, so I'm envious, but uh, where people really just want you to give them the entire regulatory analysis, not only on Twitter, but in public and for nothing. And since certainly for me, I'm in the business of being a lawyer. I like to get paid for my expertise, um, unless I'm doing something as fun as this, in which case I'm all in on volunteering. Um, but uh, let me let me ask you about sort of some a few more serious things right now. So 18,000 followers is a pretty big following in a really rarefied niche. And I have a few questions about this sort of niche part of it. The first one is, um, you know, that's a pretty low, big platform. I know I know who follows you and it's a lot of people who can be good amplifiers of well placed comments and ideas. Um, do you ever want to use your platform to like sort of change the way our laws work? and? And if so, what would you want to change? I think um, it would be great to find an avenue for using my, you know, using my powers for good, uh, as it were. Uh, I, I think my desire for privacy and anonymity might ironically present a substantial obstacle to that. I don't think Congress takes anonymous testimony from novelty Twitter accounts. <laughs> um, you know, but in the meantime, you know, in, in my personal capacity, you know, I do what I can to emphasize um, appropriate customer privacy controls and, and security as a first class citizen of the work that I do in, in, in my day job. Um, as far as, you know, going further than that, uh, I'm not sure what, you know, what a good approach would be, but, you know, maybe there is some space for collaboration with some of the other higher profile folks, uh, folks like yourself and, and others that, uh, that are, you know, on, on my uh, timeline who would be able to amplify some interesting ideas. Uh, you know, I don't know if you wanted to segue into that one about prospect for changes in HIPAA or, or something else. Yeah, I, I think that'd be great. Um, I, it's definitely something for this particular audience at the biohacking village that we talked a lot about last year. Last year, I did a presentation about how to, you know, what were the laws and how to influence them. I think that in many ways, the consumer privacy conversation is somewhat moribund. Obviously, the Biden administration came in with some very specific 
um, agenda items that you know have to do with COVID and getting the economy back on track and infrastructure. And then, of course, the politics of Congress are very complicated right now with these mar uh, very thin majorities, sort of not really a majority in the Senate. Um, but it's also a situation from, to my mind, uh, being sort of in privacy and, and a digital health advocate that if we don't fix the consumer privacy side of the equation, then the power of digital information to really help us improve our society will be quite a lot forestalled. And so I'm a huge advocate of actually individual citizens letting their Congress people know what's important to them. Um, but what do you think? I mean, you're, you're looking at that. You're getting a lot of information from people on Twitter, and there are a wide, a wide variety of people. Are people, obviously, they, they don't understand where HIPAA ends, so there's that. But what else are you observing in the way people are interacting with you about their consumers' awareness of their privacy rights, whether privacy is important to them, as opposed to like a convenient political excuse? Yeah, I think it's both. Um, you know, as far as awareness goes, I don't, I don't think that, like over the last year, I don't think I've observed that people are becoming any more aware of, of their privacy rights and laws. Um, you know, even with like recent articles that there have been from uh, some of the trusted news outlets highlighting how incorrect people are about what HIPAA is really about. There's so much resistance to those facts. You know, again, just going, going back to like Marjorie Taylor Greene, she continues to spout about HIPAA in, in wrong ways and, and she's making it worse. Um, I don't have data to support, you know, the level of awareness. Um, you know, and my, my viewpoint on it will be naturally biased by what I'm observing, right? I'm looking for the, the worst and dumbest things that I can find right. uh, because they're the funniest to talk about. Um, but, you know, I, what I really think is HIPAA for a lot of people is a stand in for the general privacy protections that they wish they had. Um, it, it may be the only thing, the only raw regulation that that they've been exposed to in the privacy space. So I don't blame most normal people for not understanding it after not even reading the notice of privacy practices that they got handed at their doctor's office. Like that's probably how most lay people are even introduced to the concept of HIPAA. So short on details, they're, they're, they can be excused, you know, for not knowing. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's a, as a stand-in, I think that's a really great way to frame it. But uh, then we have to assume that people wish they had some kind of better privacy rights, what are our prospects for that? And, and I mean, you know, there's like the European method, there's like the Brazilian method, there's the, you know, state of California, state of Colorado, there's a lot of different ideas kicking around. Um, do you see kind of any prospects for that? And, and if so, where do you think they should go? Which direction should we go? I think, um, you know, thinking about some of the other laws that are out there, you know, GDPR, PIPA, you know, it, the UK's Privacy uh, Data Privacy Act. There, there's all these templates, right? Cal California has the CPP. Colorado just passed a new one. You know, and all of these things can serve as templates and experiments for, you know, figuring out what works and what doesn't, and what consumers and you know individuals need and, and don't care about. Um, you know, and so that state by state aspect is interesting. You know, it's one of the benefits of federalism. You know, we can try things across different states and see how it goes. And, you know, it, it, people in, in their own kind of unique cultures and in those states can, can ask for the things they want. Um, and then it gives us the opportunity to observe and, and correct and continuously improve. The downside yeah. of it, though, is you know, the resulting confusion and disparity in how individuals are protected and how companies must act. You know, think about the this huge shift to remote work we've seen. What do you do? And you, you're an employer and you've got employees in multiple states, office locations in multiple states, and the business is incorporated somewhere else. You've got probably maybe even some global offices. How do you possibly begin to manage the, the different privacy regulations in, you know, in, in a single population that has unique laws that apply to it? You know, or even in the consumer retail space, how does somebody like Amazon handle 50 different privacy regulations for 50 different states? And what if you're a customer and you have homes in different, two different states and now you, when you buy a thing, which privacy regulation applies to it? And so I, I would advocate that, you know, that this is just to give a little bit of window into my, my philosophy. I, I think this is one of the rare cases where I, where, where I would want the federal government to take a position 
and for that position to be largely driven by individuals who have done, like you said earlier, contact your, your congressperson, let them know what matters to you about privacy, let them know how you're not being served, let them know how you've been injured by you know, privacy breaches uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then maybe we can actually get something that represents uh, the needs of a broad cross section and doesn't create undue burdens for everybody to try to implement and understand. Yeah, and I think that's right. And I mean, it's, you know, the whole conversation in Congress is more about good, good thing for the states that can take action, but it is, you know, the people are mobile and so is their data. And that for that reason alone, we should have something that's the same everywhere. I, I'm supposedly an expert in this and I don't want to have to think about it as I move from state to state or buy something from through Amazon, but the shipper is actually in Kentucky. Like, I don't want to have to think about it, you know, and, and, and I can imagine what it's like for somebody who barely, who knows enough about HIPAA to know that it's a thing and spells it wrong, right? Um, as opposed to uh, being a general law that applies to everyone. I, I, I don't know what will make the, will jumpstart the political conversation. Perhaps it's um, something having to do with cybersecurity or the other activities that um, are occurring relative to our big social media platforms. And so I wanna turn there um, in uh, some of our remaining time. Um, so, you know, the Biden administration has done a couple of things since coming into office. One is it enacted a really, uh, what appears to be a very uh, broad and cross-cutting executive order on cybersecurity, but my take on it is that it's primarily about um, the supply chain, particularly the supply chain controlled by the government, which makes a lot of sense given what executive orders do. They don't regulate private conduct. They tell the executive branch how to execute their duties. Um, but sometimes, especially in the purchasing realm, the way the executive branch executes its duty can really have a great ripple effect into the rest of society. And so a question has come up that we would we really would appreciate your insights on, which is, you know, will that executive order on cybersecurity change anything about the, we, what we experience as consumers and healthcare patients or healthcare people working in healthcare? Um, from a privacy and security perspective, I don't see that, but maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, I mean, executive orders can only do so much, as you pointed out, right? By their nature and, and constitutional limits on executive power, their scope is limited. Biden can direct his agencies to undertake these efforts and figure out how they spend money and who they spend it with. But this infrastructure uh, hardening is going to take a ton of time and money. Whatever they don't have in the budget, they'll have to run through Congress. Uh, and back to your point about Congress and its, you know, moribund nature, uh, I don't see progress happening there. Um, and with all, you know, what we, if, if we do manage to spend the money, I think what we'll mostly see is an enrichment of existing IT contractors, federal IT contractors like General Dynamics, Booz Allen, Hamilton, Raytheon, et cetera. I see these kinds of executive orders more as a vehicle for publicity and a call to action than than something that actually does a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not especially bothered that th this order doesn't mention health or health care. You know, it, I, I think to the extent that there are federal systems that handle health care data, you know, uh, I guess Medicare and Medicaid could be affected by this. So if we've hardened the infrastructure that supports those services and, and those, uh, those agencies, then, you know, the, the people that are using those services should experience some knock on benefit from that. But, uh, you know, the, the other side of it, the thing that scares me about executive orders like this is that whenever the government starts talking about and, and using the language of fear, which you can definitely read that in, in that executive order, the fear of you know cyber attacks and, and all these things, you can expect bad things um, yeah. when we pass the Patriot Act and, and, all, and all that domestic surveillance that came with the Patriot Act. That's one example. And so I worry about a, a potential expansion of that kind of activity, you know, with you know, like an unholy alliance between the federal government and network carriers, you know, and, and trying to do things like, you know, go go and get get those back doors to encryption methods that the that the federal government's been begging for for decades. Yeah. So that's that's what I see as a potential downside of this kind of of order and the things that might come out of it. You know, it's an interesting discussion point as, as a person who, whose data was stolen by whoever packed, hacked OPM, 
um you know they they took a whole big file i know i know exactly of, of mine what they took but also many 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 millions of americans um you know and at the end of the day i think that the story in the po in the washington post which has pretty good reporting in cybersecurity, was that you know OPM outsourced something that, that outsourced something that outsourced it to somebody else who outsourced it to China and a backdoor got built in. Um, and so that all I always think about the supply chain and how it basically uh, is a uh, something that comes into conflict with the government's desire to spend as little of taxpayer money as possible. And it's a complicated, a complicated thing. Good cybersecurity takes resources. Yes, it certainly does. And, and that supply chain, I mean, that's, you know, we, we've seen lots of supply chain attacks in, in the last few years, and that's going to continue to grow, especially when there's valuable data targets out there. Yep. And and when people are, you know, giving giving them short shrift, um, that's like almost a whole conversation for a whole nother day. Um, but I had a second thing sure I wanted is. to ask you about relative to the Biden administration. So the second thing they've been doing, and, and some of this dates back to the Trump administration and the last uh, years of the Obama administration as well, but some of it is new, is really kind of trying to look at um, the, the relationship of um, platforms, large platforms, dominant platforms with higher volumes of data, and I'll get to a few of those in a second, and that the impact of that on competition. So, um, you know, we have a new, a brand new, taught off the press last week, executive order on um, competition in uh, social media platforms, really looking at, or, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Googles, the Amazons of the world. But even before that, we had um, the HHS attempt to kind of unblock health information that was really held by two or three dominant EHR systems, which are, uh, from a structural standpoint, analogous to a Google or a Facebook, like everybody's there and that's why you go there, right? That's the walled garden and all that kind of stuff. And so, and that resulted in this, you know, ban on information blocking and the governmental attempts literally since 2015 to fortify um, the right of you and I as individuals to get and control our own health data from a holder of it. So in my mind, those things are related because the more you hoard the data, the harder it is for incumbents to bring new ideas to market, new innovations to market. And of course, the harder it is for patients uh, if their data is being hoarded to, you know, take the action they might want to take to find another doctor or whatever it is, because they can't get their data out of the place it is. And I was wondering if you had um, sort of any thoughts about um, whether really focusing on these incredibly large data, data oh, I was going to say one more thing. And the third thing is, Obviously, within the big social media platforms, people do use those to, you know, to talk about their health. Their Facebook is chock full of, um, uh, you know, groups where people are providing peer support for particular health conditions from HIV AIDS to domestic violence to breast cancer to uh, veterans with PTSD. It's really the whole gamut. And they're all kind of trapped because there are no other networks that have that level of peer um, interaction you know the same number of peers as it were so people really feel stuck there as well so looking at that whole big stew of the relationship between large caches of data and the effect of that on competition both from a business innovation perspective that might benefit consumers and from uh, the perspective of consumer empowerment do you see the same kind of uh issues that i see or is, do you have a different perspective that you know it's okay how would we go about uh how and if if it's not so great what should we do about it i agree completely that privacy and competition are inextricably intertwined you know just from my own experiences you might guess that i'm a fairly outspoken person i've had my share uh, of gee, i never would have thought that right I've had my share of run-ins with Facebook's defective, in my opinion, content moderation system. I don't mean the algorithms only, I mean the people that review bad automated decisions as well. And I would love nothing more than to be able to take, you know, take my toys and go home, take my data from their platform and, and take it to somewhere else. You know, maybe MeWe or some other social network upstart could build an import method so that I could download my Facebook data from there and import it over there. And then boom, now I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I still have all my stuff. 
Um, but the problem with that is the network effect. I can't convince many people to migrate off of Facebook, despite all of the things that they also don't like about it. It is just so powerful and, and the force of inertia keeping people in that one place makes it very, very hard to, to make that kind of a move. So you know, because that the, the competition is limited both naturally by that network effect and mechanically by the information service providers like Facebook. You know, there is no way to migrate your data from one to the other. You can't migrate your, your friend network from one you know, service to another. Um, consumers don't really have a way out. To your point, these support groups that are on you know, Facebook or, or take your pick of whichever network, it's very, very difficult to, to pick up and move that. And there's so much value in those communities being able to support each other and, and do all of that work that, you know, it, it feels like there's a spot for the government to push on this somehow. I'm, I'm a fan of a light touch from our government, but there's, there's got to be some way to balance the, the those the property rights of service providers who've built these immense platforms and run them at, at incredible cost and the privacy protections and maybe portability protections for individuals. You know, thinking about HIPAA, you know, tying this back to HIPAA, that was originally about portability, right? The ability yeah. to move from one employer to another, move your, your health data, move your health coverage, all that stuff. And so I think there's a pretty strong parallel there for you know, a personal information portability regulation. That if if you are you know submitting all your information and it's getting stored in these these massive databases, you ought to be able to have control over it. And I think that's something that people could all kind of agree to. I think if you talk to individuals, they would agree to that. Uh, but getting people to think about that and care about that enough that they would talk to their representatives about it, that's a different kind of effort. Yeah. No, I think I think that's right. But that that's a great segue to my next question, which is. Of course, um, HHS and ONC and the Office for Civil Rights are working on this pretty hard with this fortification of the longstanding right under HIPAA of an individual to get a copy of their own data. And of course, 20 years ago, that meant a photocopy from a manila folder, but it's come to mean you know, the electronic data in the EHR that um, your doctor's office is storing on you, or in, in, fact, in, in this case, your health plan as well. And um, you know the requirement that covered entities make that data available when you you as a person present an app to them i was actually just talking about this at work yesterday and i can tell you i will be changing doctors in uh january changing health systems and i plan on taking all my data with me if i can <laughs> depending on how hard it is um but i was wondering i know you're aware of that what are your plans are you gonna are you gonna get your data and put it you know on your files at home or pull it into your apple um, health kit or whatever your own personal PHR is, you're going to take advantage of your right? To whatever extent I need to, you know, I'll, I'll say I'm, I'm blessed with generally very good health. So I have what I would say is fairly limited, you know, PHI hanging out out there in various databases. So, you know, for me, I, I don't, I don't typically experience difficulty with getting that data from the doctor's offices that's or hospitals great. or whoever when I when I need it. But that's also because I know about these rights I'm, and I am able to, as an outspoken person, be a strong advocate for myself with the health, health system. That's not something that everybody is blessed with. Right. Uh, you know, I, but all, all that said, like, I think the requirement that PHI be made available electronically and, and transferable to a personal health app is great. I think going back to the the commentary about portability and competition and privacy and security, you know, there have to be some pretty strong controls and I think pretty significant penalties in place available for those personal health apps. You know, if th those become pretty rich targets again for cybersecurity you know, threat actors, and and so where where that data consolidates it becomes a, an interesting target. It might, yeah. it might have the opposite effect. If there's an explosion of personal health apps, then maybe that distribution of the data across, you know, dozens of, uh, of different systems and, and databases and applications means that there's never as much of a single big, important, interesting target. You know, that, that might be an interesting effect. Sort of like the blockchain, but for real. 
Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm a cynic about blockchain. But yeah, you, you know, I understand. What you mean. And also, it, it could be in, in our dream world that if there's an explosion of competition in the space of uh, people helping you as an individual manager health data, that there will be competition on, on privacy. I mean, it might be that it turns into pay for privacy, but it also could be just right rate a uh, rising tide of privacy in 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 the way these apps function that's that's for sure um well we're coming up to the end of our time i have one last question for you which is here we are we're making this recording for the biohacking village at defcon if you had one thing about hipaa that you want your audience to take away with them today what would it be uh, the the big thing really is hipaa is about more than just your privacy. Uh, a key thing that I think everybody needs to know about it, and we talked about it a little bit already, is that right of access. The ability for you, the patient, to always have the right to receive your health information is so important. For you to be able to advocate for yourself, um, you know, you, you have to be able to see what your records say. You might need to audit them and correct things that aren't accurate because not everything is perfect in the health system. And you know, the ability to then share that data with other providers that might not be connected with, you know, the insurer that you're working with, or might be in a, you know, a, a specialty provider in another state, and it's difficult for them to interact with your provider directly. You know, I, I have friends who I, I've counseled about this, where they're having terrible time, you know, they're, they've got complex health problems that they're trying to navigate, and they're having difficulty getting their data delivered from, you know, like the imaging provider hasn't been imaging able to send the imaging over to their specialist, right? Yeah, and, images and are so for me, like, yeah, well, different formats, different applications, different systems. I mean, that's all, it's all hard, right? You go to, you go to the imaging place and they hand you a, a CD and it's like, what am I going to do with this? Right. You know? Well, you know, imaging um, is and, a weird and so the other. I was just going to say imaging is a weird one because in fact, the radiology centers are usually using storing it in the cloud and they could just give you a credential. Right, they don't actually sure. have to give you the CD, they could give you a credential or they could give a credential to the person you want to have read the image. It doesn't have to be a CD, but did, that's like a whole nother problem. Yeah. Did, did HIPAA scare them off from being able to do that? Were, were all of the, the scary regulations and things something that's, that made them say, well, no, I have to do this in this like maximally secure way and it's in a CD. Nobody could ever intercept that, you know. I don't um, know. I, that's one of the myths I never got to bust, but it's definitely I've looked at it myself for my own radi radiology. Like, why don't you just give me a credential to your cloud and I'll go look at it. Right. And then uh, beyond the, that, the other thing changing in that right of access is uh, a, a new requirement to go to 15 days instead of 30 for the delivery of those records. And so that's really key too. you know, when, when you're trying to get something, you know, when you have a health problem, time is of the essence and, you know, you can't be waiting on providers to send data back and forth to each other. Sometimes you have to take it into your own hands to acquire that data and, and move it to them yourself. And so I think, again, just right of access, everybody should go, go visit the hhs.gov website, search for HIPAA right of access, read about your provider's obligations, understand what they have to do and, and, and what they're not allowed to do and, and make sure that you're able to advocate for yourself in the health system. There's also hot tip, there are actually some really great videos, live action videos that are on the OCR's YouTube channel and you can, uh, Put the links on your phone and then you can just play them in the doctor's office for the receptionist That's even better fantastic. i know having having written the check for those videos uh we had a lot of fun making those well we were we are kind of at time and i'm really glad to have been able to do this i want to give you a chance to ask me a question if you want i kind of live out loud and people know who i am but if there's anything i can answer for you i'd be happy to any questions that you want to put on out on the table I guess what do you what do you think is going to be the the evolution of things over the next you know, decade in 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 health IT? You know where where are we really going to go? I mean, there's stuff starting to happen now. With, you know, systems are getting more interoperable and all that. Mm -hmm. Does that just kind of continue? Does that accelerate? Uh, what what do you what do you see happening there? I mean, I've I've been working in this space for a long time, and I definitely see that the digital technology has 
um, really enabled a convergence of economic sectors that used to operate pretty separately and they're converging at kind of at a business to business level the the thing i don't know is that back to sort of more abundant consumer privacy law i think that they will um we will never really get the value of that from a uh an economic learning and improving our society uh perspective until we can make sure that consumers feel 100 percent secure or far more secure than they feel now about how data about them is being used because the consumer mistrust will erode the ability of the digital technology to innovate it's a, it'll be like a little like the tide coming in and out right there's always a wave in but there's always the undertow pulling back um so that's what i would really like to see solved i would really like to see a world in which consumers feel a lot more confidence um, both about what's happening specifically with information collected in the health information system, so technically subject to HIPAA right now, but also information that is, some people call it health adjacent, information that's about your health, but is being exposed about you in the rest of your life, in Facebook, in your Amazon shopping, in your Google search, um, you know, in your in your personal social media posts, wherever you post your, your own status, your flu tracking and all that kind of stuff, so that people feel that they can contribute knowledge without um, actually having it harm them. That's where I wanna go is people to be more confident about contributing knowledge that they're not gonna be harmed when they do that. So that's why I hope, that's where I hope we go. That's why I get up every morning and keep working at it. Yeah, that sounds like a great future. I'd love to see that. <laughs> yeah, well, this has been super fun. Thank you so much for being open and sharing your views with us. Um, for the audience, this is a great uh, follow. Just Keep keep the follow count up. It's at bad hippo with two P's at bad hippo takes. Um, it'll be a source of constant amusement and you might even be able to post a question. So thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it and enjoy Thanks the for having me, Lucia. Oh, it was it was amazing. Let's stay in touch on Twitter. We shall. All right, take, take care. care. Bye.